What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Attack with me, Peter Santa Maria, and we got a great guest this week on the show, uh, artist Tom Whalen. If you know my work or if you collect movie posters or art in general, you probably have heard his name or seen his artwork. Tom is just an amazing guy. He's got a great eye, a pioneered style, and more importantly, he's just one of the kindest people I've ever met, most generous with his knowledge and information. I don't want to take too much time because this conversation is really good, and I feel like if you have any similar interests that I do, you're going to learn a lot from this one. So please pay close attention. Uh, make sure you follow Tom at Strong Stuff on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff, and uh, just get ready to see some kick-ass work and hear a brilliant dude speak. All right, guys. Well, dude, uh, thanks again for doing this, and if you would, tell people what you do, because I know what you do, and I love what you do, but for those people out there, those heathens that don't know, let them know. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Tom Whalen, a.k.a. Strong Stuff, if that confuses people sometimes, but uh, uh, I'm primarily, I guess I'd say, poster designer, uh, logos, pins, uh, but posters is where I've done my the bulk of my damage over the last decade. Um, a lot of work for Mondo. Uh, gallery shows and um, those have kind of served as calling cards to get into some other fun stuff uh, yeah one of those things that you did that I didn't even realize until yesterday when I was uh, looking up your credits is the cover to this awesome book uh, Vinyl Conflict oh, yeah. holy crap man yeah. this has been like uh, yeah. one of my favorite books to look at but this cover uh, jumped out at me at Comic Con last year in San Diego I was like what the heck is this thing and uh, what a rad piece of artwork. Did you ever cut a print of this? Did you guys ever make prints of this? Yeah, we have. Uh, we did prints that they sold at the auction. Uh, that was like a, that's a catalog auction. I love it. I, yeah, it wasn't a, abundantly clear. I thought it was just like a cr cool collection at first, but then I realized it was an auction guy, in a book. The guy that runs that uh, the auction house, Jordan, he, he, he did that entire layout himself. Uh -huh. And I, I always – when I'm not in charge of something, I, you know, I did the cover and then he, he basically carried the layout throughout the book. So that, that thing is beautiful. It's awesome. It's awesome. Even my dumb ass didn't even realize it was an auction book for a little while. I thought it was kind of like uh like a wizard for vinyl toys. And so <laughs> yeah, um, no, no, it was like one, it was like a two day auction that the, he had online. Amazing. Uh, last year. Yeah. Well, you know, the, what, the first question I have to ask you out of the gate, and I know we don't know each other that well, and so I apologize if it's a little jarring, but it's something that I've thought about for quite some time. Oh, I feel like – no, no, it's okay. I feel like okay. Um, there are a few artists out there who get to a certain point where there almost be uh, begins to exist this subgenre of imitation art, which is not 100% – given credit to you and sometimes i've met the artists who do it and don't even realize what they're doing because sometimes they're like imitating somebody who's imitating you and uh yeah. and it's, and i'm all about you know i went to art school and i studied all the artists you know great artists and designers and i take tons of influence but i'm and so i'm all about that but i find it fascinating how brazen some of these um adaptations <laughs> are <laughs> and uh and actually i was when i was talking to our mutual friend jeff may he's this is uh one of the questions he urged me to bring up he's like how do you feel about or do you even care about people adopting this style and how does it affect you as an artist that's also running a brand slash business it's not like you're just throwing you know artwork out for yeah. the sake of artwork right I, I value that the look I've developed for myself, obviously, because it is my brand and it's what what stands out ahead of me before anybody talks to me or reaches out to me. It's the, the artwork is what has to hook them. So, yes, there's been a lot of imitation or theft, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I have a lot of, and you know, I don't know. Maybe it's generational. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm 36, so I I feel like there's a lot of students that reach out to me, and they say. You know, hey, I did this in your style. Can you take a look at it? And I don't. Maybe they don't know that it, that's kind of offensive. I, I try to whenever I get an email or a, or a, a, a message like that, I try to steer them in the way of you know, develop your own style. It's one thing to 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 learn how to use the tools, but just push out in your own style because you're never going to get you, you if you keep generating. And I used to do it too when I was when I first started drawing as a kid. I was drawing like McFarlane right. and drawing like 
Mignola and and until you get your feet under you, I know you have to have like the training wheels on. But I always encourage people to, you know, don't don't be a slave to recreating something so close to the to what you what you admire. Take what take the pieces of it and uh, and, and make it your own. Which I feel you know even even the look I have, I, it's it's pulled from many sources, and I didn't draw that way from day one. Um, so I, I know it's an evolution, but there's times when I'm like, there's times when it's obviously just a rip done in a quick, in a quick, make a quick buck. Yeah. There's a nuance to that, you know, and, uh, I taught art and design from every, all ages to kindergarten up to graduate students at the university of Miami for 13 years. And you could tell that there's a lot of faux pas that a student makes that they don't really know what, that they're doing it. And that's okay because yeah. you educate them. But then there's a difference between that and then you almost find clone booths at conventions. Yes. And that's wild yeah. to me because, yeah. you know, I, 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 don't, I, I could never do it. I, I wanted to be Mignola so bad and Eric Powell and Scott Morse. Yeah. Those are the guys I looked up to so much. And, um, and so I would always try to draw like them, but eventually – you know, I would say, okay, the think of this as a smoothie that you're building. You don't want to just say, okay, and now here's my less than version of them. Let me take all those elements, put them together with other influences and make something new and different. But that's fascinating to me because yeah. you're a business and you're pitching a style to your clients. If a client, you know, doesn't, I mean, I don't know, has that ever been an issue with a client where you've, you know, thought you had something and then you got maybe uh said well we're not gonna we're, you know we're gonna go somewhere else and then you see they work with a knockoff has that ever happened no i've never seen yeah. it it may happen um i was just in a bidding thing recently and uh they kept the client kept coming back and asking me to lower the bid to stay competitive and wow. i felt like at a certain point it if you're gonna go a different way go a different way or set a budget. My, that's my thing. Set a budget. Tell me what the budget is. I'll take it or I'll leave it. And when you're trying to hit numbers like that, I feel like sometimes they may have somebody else that's close to you that they're, you know, maybe they want to use you, but they're, they're trying to get the right price and use you. It's trying to, it's trying to pick up all the jacks in one swoop. Yeah. So I feel like, um, I've never seen it, but I, I, I don't imagine that it has right. never happened. Um, it's fascinating. And you know, I knew of your work, you know, for a while, but I think I most uh, realized how prolific you were um, after doing this last Mondo gig that we both were a part of, the Godzilla run. Yeah. And um, I had been aware of Mondo since whew, for a while, but I never, I hadn't followed as closely, and I definitely had never purchased a Mondo poster because I never had the money to, and 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 you know, I just, I was, it wasn't in my periphery. But when I started to release them, it opened my eyes to this whole world of the Mondo fandom and, you know, the, the people who are trading posters in the aftermarket and who their favorite artists were. And, you know, obviously you've been working with Mondo for a long time and you've experienced this for a long time. What, what was, how, did, how has working with a company like that changed your career over time? Because for me, in an instant, everything changed. In overnight, yeah. everything's changed. I don't know what, to, what year they started. Uh, but it, I remember in, I believe 2010, I had written a note on my desk, like just like fantasy notes, like, uh, you know, things I wanted to do in the next couple of years. And one of them was contact Mondo. So that was, they were, they had quickly jumped on my radar and I knew it was a place I wanted to work with. And then it wound up, I did a series of posters for a local theater. They were doing, uh, uh, it was, it's called the colonial theater in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And they, um, so it's where the blob was filmed, the 1950s blob. Um, so they, uh, at the time, were doing what's called First Friday Fright Nights. And um, they did a, a horror or sci-fi themed movie every Friday night, the first Friday of the month. And I volunteered to do their posters for them for a year. Um, so it, we sold them at the shows and put them out in the lobby. Um, I, after doing that for a year, I think that's how I got on Mondo's radar. And... Um, they contacted me to do Star Wars and Star Trek uh, right off the bat. And that was not, – not only did I love working with those two properties, but from there on, it's just been such a good – they have such a high profile. And and now I find – and I've said this before, but the posters that people collect now almost are like 24 by 36 business cards that are hanging on walls of 
directors, and they have such a wide reach that those those images become basically giant business cards for me that are spread all around where I want to work. That's amazing. And yeah, it's, it's such a cool, such a cool like way to propagate. It's the amazing. And I, I wanted to go back a little bit into something that you had mentioned because literally on my list of questions, I have one point circle that you mentioned just now from when I was listening to an interview that you were giving with someone else. And you know, the whole point of me doing this show, the reason anybody would want to listen to my, you know, fat head talk about anything is because I'm trying to highlight a moment or moments in different creators, you know, path that kind of like set things going so that people understand how to go from that point A to point B. It's all I ever wanted to know growing up, going to conventions. How do I do this? How do I get to where you are? And there's the obvious answers like, well, work your ass off, get really good and all that kind of stuff. But there's that one thing that you just mentioned that I have highlighted, which is that you went to the local theater and you asked for this gig. Now, can you talk about that? Because that wasn't a gig that already existed. Was it just something that you had an idea to do? And did they call out to you or did you go to them? Because that to me is huge. I went I, yeah, I went to them. I had been doing uh, like little uh, like conventions. Uh, just selling little like three by four cards of different busts uh, of of pop culture characters, and then I expanded that the next year. This was like two thousand three, two thousand four, and then they took off at the at the uh, wizard convention. And then the next year, I did like eleven by fourteen posters, and then it was not too long after that where I contacted the the theater. I knew they were running that film series, so I reached out. And the first one I did was uh, was Aliens. And it just for me, it was a thrill to just to see it in the lobby. Like we printed one large one for the that would uh, they'd hang in the lobby and in the the uh, case and on the street. So you, as you're walking by on the street, you'd see it like le- the the week leading up to the film. And then we sold like digital copies in the uh, at right before the screening. Um, but yeah, the, I I went to them for that. I saw that the the kind of opening for that and then the the crew that was in charge of that uh series the the people that curated that um like a lot of guys my age like our age that you know were kind of into the same vein of films and and um yeah and it just we just stayed on that for a year it was it was a blast you know that's the most interesting thing for me because it's almost like that was the spark right that kind of set everything going that little moment where you thought I'm going to go ask for this thing. The funniest thing that I notice is that when I'm talking to other artists and and their paths is there seems to be this preset notion that as an artist you don't go ask for things. They come to you. And and exactly. that is not how my brain works, you know, like I I was in a, you know, bands my whole life as a teenager and we had to beg for shows to play with the big boy bands locally in Miami and I've gotten a lot of cool stuff happen to me just because I ask but I always ask with a mindset of I have something to offer you know and one of the things that I got (laughs) one of the things that I mean I've actually been scolded by another artist who by telling me like you asked for that oh my god right but I'm putting this out there so everybody can hear this you know who's the five people who are listening but uh the idea that when when I did that Mondo release that we did together, the next day I got three, four, t- up to ten different direct messages from artists that I know who were kind of congratulating me, but also with the oh, like feeling you, have. yeah, almost like oh, I've been yeah. trying to reach out to them. Well, I've been trying to get their attention forever, and how come they don't get me? And how come they don't get artists like so and so? Like this is like this plighted you know group of individuals that Mondo is sliding, and I. And the reality is yeah. that I did the same thing that you did at Comic Con last year. I was there coincidentally, had a booth there because of some serendipitous occasion. But they came to my booth, and we were talking. And then I literally asked them, "Can I do a poster for you? And I really want to do a Godzilla poster. Do you have that license?" That's it. Yeah, that's it. And you know, you find that those are the people you yeah. want to work with because I know everybody there and they love being pitched like ideas and they'll tell you if it's good and they'll tell you and eh, maybe it's not so good but that those are the people that you want to find there may you're right you there may be people that you reach out to and and pitch stuff and it doesn't 
go anywhere or they don't want to hear a pitch and you know so be it it might may have been a cool project but there probably won't be a lasting um uh, relationship like uh, a creative back and forth relationship like with mondo and and the, to me it's just so important i want everyone to hear that that you went out and you asked for this thing and it helped kind of like spark everything that came after that is there any poster that you've done whether it's with mondo or on your own that really and this is a question more about like uh, the mindset you know when you start up a project like when i start up a project i have an idea of what this is going to look like and whether it's going to be awesome or how it's going to come up and sometimes it comes out really great and i'm satisfied and sometimes it doesn't look anything like i expected it to look and uh, is there any um designs or posters that you've put out I'm sure there are many that you really feel like this is the one that I hit the mark on or this one I'm like really came out exactly how I expected it and I'm happy with that. Yeah, I I would say I, I feel like I've been doing this, like especially posters. Yeah. I've been doing this for probably – I started with Mondo in 2010, so call it a decade. I, I feel like I have a – I can conceptualize what it's going to look like at the end pretty quickly. There's, there's always the – odd poster that uh you think it's going to work and you try the idea and it doesn't work and then you then you you're forced to take a take a left turn and make it something that it wasn't initially going to be um but generally i i can i can i can take an idea and and force i don't want to say force it because that doesn't sound very creative but but kind of kind of get my initial thought across but uh, th- yeah there's there's definitely a few that have taking left turns that I um, I'm happy with. And then, you know, again, with good art direction, um, sometimes you, p- you put something up that you think is great and it comes back with changes and it, it becomes better. It becomes a new thing after, after you've taken another swipe. That's at it. really important too. Like the people hear that even at the level that you're at, you're still taking art direction from people and it's right. It's a, it's a smart thing to be able oh, yeah. to take that art direction. Yeah, you have to swallow your pride a little bit and realize that when you get get bigger projects, it's it's pretty hard to exist in a vacuum. Like you're going to have input, especially when you're getting. I work with. I've been working with some bigger brands lately. I worked with Coke last year, um, and Target. I do occasional work for, and you just have to realize that as much as you want your style on that, it's it's ultimately a gigantic brand that you have to have to. Um, play by the rules how many how many projects do you think you're working on in a given month and uh, how often do you finish like what is your time frame for start to finish on something so for a post i have i mean i have a list of stuff that i always like i have probably 15 to 20 projects open at any point um a lot of them are pins which are obviously a much quicker turn than than posters um that uh, i'm working on uh i do the packaging for the power rangers uh, lightning collection from Hasbro. So those take roughly maybe two to three days each, probably closer to two, unless it's a, a like an alien character. Um, for a poster, it probably takes a day. I give myself a day and a half to get the composition and sketch together. And then once that's approved, if it's approved, um, I'd say seven to eight working days to, to knock that out. But I've, I've everything kind of dovetailed together. It's not like I work through one project and then close it and then open the next one. I have a lot of stuff cooking at one time and I just kind of bounce back and Is forth. Is that ideal for you to have a few things at once? Yeah, I yeah. do like that. And I like, I kind of have my schedule set up that during the day times I work on like the main project, like a poster or if it's the Power Ranger stuff. And then at nighttime I do a little bit more bite size, like, uh, the pin series I do for Mondo, or I've been doing some apparel design for them. Um, I kind of, I kind of do the more bite size stuff at night. Okay. And um, so I want people to, you know, we, we're putting in assets throughout this whole interview so people can see the images of what you're working on, but I want to like go and dissect a couple. We had talked about that before, if that's cool with you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yep, yep, um, sure. you know, uh, the first one I wanted to talk about, cause it's, it's so fantastic. I mean, it's right up my alley. Is this Mecha Godzilla Terra Mecha Godzilla poster you did uh, for the recent Mondo drop? Um, by the way, man, how bummed out were you when that show ended up not happening? I was looking forward to that more than anything in my life at that point. I know, me too. I was considering going. I was. Down I had there. tickets um, booked. Just, yeah, that was a that was a, a yeah. bummer. 
because I, I I had been going down um, once a well, almost once a year for like four or five years, and it's been a while since I've been there. That was like the excuse to go back down, and then everything everything oh, burned. Bummer. I have this hope that we'll get to do an, an, a, a second attempt one day in the future, but uh, that would be I, awesome. This is a great idea. Well, okay, so I have this image up on the screen, hopefully right now, of terror up of mecha godzilla poster that you did now you did two versions one that was the with the blue background and the japanese text and one with the green and the uh english text but um looking at either one you want to focus on so can you walk first of all i think it's important because there's some people who probably don't know the the way you work so you're working in illustrator primarily which and i actually i can send you uh for if if you want to show this too i can show you what the rough draft oh i'd love to see like. that yeah yeah uh, so I, I i draft everything in illustrator and it's uh it's it's not traditionally what a sketch would look like um so i'll send that to you because basically for something like this i just kind of get the pieces i i knew mecha godzilla had to be the centerpiece so um i have the x plus the 30 centimeter oh, we're gonna so talk just, about so, that oh, don't sure. worry yeah i see a lot of stuff behind you that uh <laughs> very appealing um so i took reference of that and i i said this on an interview the other day one of the coolest things about this job is being able to buy something like that and and it's a write-off i've been any any chance i get to um to to if it if it calls for reference it's it's right to the internet to to shop but anyway i took some high-res shots of that and uh i knew that was going to be the center and then basically watch the film i'll typically watch if i know i'm going to be working on a, a a movie poster or show i'll watch that show or movie as i'm working on the previous job just kind of on my computer screen in the background um just to kind of absorb it one more time before before i jump in um so and i knew i wanted a small kaiju fight at the bottom and and um and the aliens in there obviously but i knew the centerpiece had to be Mecca i love that and so i've you know, I, I heard you mention some of the uh, influences that I think pertain a lot to the graphic sensibilities of your work, like Glazer and and uh, and Saul Bass and Chikold and all that. And I love those yeah. guys growing up. I love discovering those uh, designers in art school and then going back to looking at a lot of the 70s and 80s posters and trying to figure out where they were looking. But uh, yeah, 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 but yeah. So, do you feel like you can sense your influences, or are there things that kind of like are part of your skill set when it t- comes to composition or color that you can see in your work that you that you recognize? Not anymore. No, I feel like it's uh, it really is a feeling. Like it really just feels right to me now. I don't. I don't. I can't find where it comes from. Interesting. Anymore. And so when you. The idea of putting like this triangular composition where it's like pointing towards the right gives it a sense of like movement all the way across with that angle yeah. and it kind of directs your eye all, acro- all across. Is that something you're always thinking about in composition? Are there things that are in your head like, okay, I want to direct the eye, things like that? No, and again, this sounds like such no, a cop cool. out, but it really, it just, when when it feels right to me, it and and, and there's times when I get to the end of a job and I don't get that like 100% like it feels right. And then I'll start like pulling pieces mm. apart and ma- maybe it doesn't get, get quite to the end, but maybe like two thirds of the way through. And I'm like, this just something's wrong here. And that's again, like when I get to those points, it's great to have like uh, Rob at Mondo and Mitch and Eric to kind of bounce off of like something's not working here. Um, but for me, composition is, is a lot of what, I'm selling with my work. Like I, I feel like it has to have a dynamic composition and I don't always have that mapped out at the beginning. Um, I have, I have pieces. So I'll, I'll, I'll build these pieces really rough in illustrator and just move everything around till everything locks up. And, and it, generally if, I feel if I have a good rough draft and a good composition, it's going to cruise through to a solid piece at the end. It's hard to explain that sometimes when I would, uh, talk to students, you know, the idea of ha- being able to sketch something from your head compositionally. And I feel like part of that is all the years spent studying work, 
and like digesting yeah. work yep. that it almost be, it comes like you're saying it's internalized to a point where it's an instinct where it's hard to, you can't teach that instinct but you could teach the path to the instinct but um it, it it's it's awesome because you you really get a sense of movement where there seem to be a lot of static images. The composition gives you that energy, the movement uh, coming across it. And I love for me, my favorite part is these little um, like like the little token, the circular design of the female character in the top uh, left or the three little stamps at the right. Those little details to me that are um, subtle you know, in, co in, uh, in, in comparison to the large bombastic nature of everything else that's going on. That really, I love that kind of stuff. I went to school wanting like hell bent on becoming a comic book illustrator and realized that I just didn't have the chops to, to, um, just the rendering sk skills weren't there. And, um, I spent a lot of time, I basically like double majored in illustration and design. So those little things are as fun to me as like anything, any any panel layouts or or anything you would see in a comic that that gives it that little pop or or, or special effects or, or type or anything. Um, I agree. Those little like buttons and and all that. I, I call it like filler. I love it. Around that, the edges, the, that, the, the, to me, to me, that yeah. makes it. And uh, I like to put in text and anything anything that can try to break up the the image is great for me. You know, you you mentioned yeah. about. Uh, wanting to be a comic artist and I had a, a note to ask you about that it's funny because that's exactly what I experienced like all I wanted to do was be a comic artist and to and to this day I feel like until I have a comic published I haven't really made it in my <laughs> mind which is <laughs> it's just crazy but it's like it's something that is in the back of my mind that that's the pinnacle even though when I experience that a lot you know, so much great work being done outside of that medium. I wonder what that is. Do you still think about that at all? Like, is that something that you ever want to do? Like do a covers or things like that? Is there? Yeah, I've done covers and that 100% scratches. What the covers edge. did you like do? I did, I, uh, I did a cover for, I did like three or four uh, variant covers for Marvel, awesome. uh, death, death lock, the, the series that uh, probably like two thousand, maybe like four, three or four years ago. And I did a uh, Web Warriors cover, and um, I did a cover for a an exclusive variant of Marvel 1001 for um, New York Comic Con last year. That completely scratches the itch. I do I do not have any interest or ability to do sequential work. I used to I used to like when I got my first design job uh, out of college. I like I would work there direct designing like direct mail, and it just wasn't like satisfying the creative itch and I would come home and like do full size um, comic pages just I would write my own stories and do full 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 size comics and pencil and I, I was like even at that point I was still like a hundred percent into exploring that dream and I like I, I realize now I just don't have the speed or the or the skill to do that. Um, but the covers have definitely scratched. Yeah, the I'm, I'm looking at the Deathlock cover cover right now. It's freaking amazing. You know, it's funny because I'm always, you know, excited by the the risks that they take design wise uh, on covers, especially in the last five ten years. It's been so interesting after yeah. years and years of seeing kind of the same stuff on the inside on the outside. And um, yeah, I, I totally see how that would scratch the itch. You just get to see, you know, hold the published thing in your hand with yeah. Yeah, it's good enough. And it's like, you know, a, a couple days worth of work and it's, it's totally that, that's my, yeah, my I love there. it. Beautiful stuff. Um, yeah, Thank man. You. So let's, if you don't mind, let's, let's look at the, the Marvel poster that you had, uh, talked uh, about now. This is a Mondo poster too, right? Or is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, if, if, if we're talking about the same one, um, that is the, the one that became the cover for, for the exclusive comic at, uh, New York it's last awesome. year. It's and it's this is you know with all the characters you got the big Venom head and Deadpool and Cap and all those characters. It's like the dream of our childhood come to life that you get to work with everybody in one image. I know, I know. We were we were not sure that we'd be able to use X Men characters on that, um, but it, it, being that this was supposed to represent the uh, modern age of Marvel, I was really like. I wasn't sure if it was going to fly for me. Like it wouldn't feel right if I couldn't get some X-Men in there. Cause that's, this is like my heyday yeah. of late eighties, 
early 90s um you know the majority of it that's where it came i from. love it it's fantastic and now i heard you talk in an interview about the composition and calling these like little floating islands and uh yeah. i love that term it's something that i think about all the time because after selling prints for a while i would realize well when people frame it up these compositions are going to be troublesome sometimes but i i agree. yeah the frame becomes an active part of what you, you spend so much time building something and you realize the frame's going to trim in a little bit and can completely I, I spend so much time making sure there's just the right amount of air and space and flow around an image and i realize that because i don't i typically don't work wall-to-wall -wall image and color so I real, but I realize a frame changes all that. It's awesome, and um, it's something that I'm. I, th I thought it was fascinating that you think about because I get so in the weeds about all the minutia of everything that sometimes I'm surprised that I'm able to make anything, and um, <laughs> and so when I heard you talking about that, I'm like, that's exactly it. That's that's part of what this job is. Is like this. You you experience you create the work and it's in your head and then it gets to be in someone's hands at some point and even thinking about how it looks online sometimes like in an icon or in an Instagram post affects how I design yeah and it, and it's hard to explain some of that and to, to to people but it's every step of the way like you were saying before your art is a business card for you every step and you never yep. know where someone's going to experience your work. And so when you're talking about these islands, that's something that I was thinking about in my work where it's like when these things are framed up, almost any frame job, this is going to look good because you're not like playing with the, the uh, rectangular bounds of the, of the paper itself. So, but this is fantastic. So when you're designing something like this, how do you design who to put where and how big to make so-and-so is that just personal preference? I yeah, and I think I felt like I, I felt if this again was supposed to represent the modern age. So for me, Cap, not that he was that in, integral in the '80s and '90s, but I felt like he, sh especially the Ultimates version, should kind of be well well placed and well represented. And um, sym symmetry wise, he just works as the centerpiece. And then Venom obviously was such a huge part of that era, and Deadpool and tried to balance it with frame it with the X-Men um, and then I, I kind of come up with lists of characters that I want to include and then tier them into what I feel is the most important and then kind of make sure they work it, occasionally I'll bounce a character from one tier to another if it works more compositionally that was very controversial how small you put spider-man in this poster <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah I, well, I figured Venom yeah, carried yeah, the weight yeah, of that yeah, era. Yeah, hundred percent. So this was meant to be a reference to the modern age of Marvel in comics. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. correct. And I think they had uh, Mondo did uh, gold and silver and modern posters, and then they were turned into variant covers. And then the funny thing about that, talking about the edges and uh, how it's trimmed, I tried to make the file dummy proof for the for the cover, and I put a magenta bar around the edges where the bleed would be so to show that it doesn't trim to that area it was just it was a transparent magenta bar and it printed and it it drove me where nuts. did it print and like that print like thousand however many copies oh. they made every there was like a magenta border on the page and it drove <laughs> drives me nuts. The, the poster came out perfectly but the it drives me crazy when i see the uh the actual the comic what do you book. do in that moment because i feel like that's the 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 nightmare that an artist has where you can't predict what's going to happen and then you have to be careful how much you complain because then um it, it's it's it, it's sometimes people don't see what's bugging you and they don't notice what's bugging you exactly i know and i i i went to mondo right away because i think marvel had previewed it a couple weeks before and i, I immediately contacted eric at Mondo and said, uh, please tell me this is just a JPEG and it's not printed. And he had, he went out to Marvel and they had, it was printed already. It was, I should have, it was me overthinking yeah. it. Like I was just trying to make it so like, I just wanted it trimmed so perfectly and like centered. It just, uh, it backfired. It's, a, I it's amazing. Cause when, when you're involved in a project, I don't know if this happens to you, but for me, when I'm involved in a project, you spend so much time on this thing that you get to the point sometimes where you're sick of looking at it you know, as sick as you can be of your own work. And um, at 
and at that point, um, you you let this thing go into the wild, and then and yep. then it's like it, it's so hard to, to to have to experience something like that because you try, like you said, so hard to make sure everything is perfect, and and you just can't. It's amazing. Um, well, it's it's a fantastic piece, and. Where does the influence come to do these kind of like seventies vibe, like uh, circles and and cylinders and ovals around the characters? Uh, I love that stuff so much. It gives me this um, like cool um, Bond intro and also like Price is Right stage setup around stuff. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, it's. I just I use them as framing devices, and I try the. You know, if you notice, there's a lot of lines on there, and there I try to keep the symmetry and the rhythm of the lines all together, so they're they're all like 45 degree angles. You get the webs and and Wolverine's claws and Cyclops' visor. Yeah, I blast. love that. That's probably the thing that you don't notice at first, and it's like everything has a purpose. It's Daredevil's club and the Cyclops. It's amazing. Right. I love stuff like that. It's like crisscrossing through the whole thing, and it kind of like segments the poster up into little chunks that you can digest yeah. as you go. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so I wanted to ask you a couple more questions, and I don't want to keep you all day, but uh, um, is there like a misconception of your work when you're either dealing with a client who deals with a lot of artists, or sometimes I find the biggest misconception is with, you know, a person to person, like you're on a show floor at a convention, and, and people are asking how the work is done, and sometimes people don't know how I do what I do, which I understand completely, but then I have yeah. to explain that so that sometimes that, that people really realize what they're getting versus something else that's, you know, made a different way. Is there a misconception with your work and how it's made or, or do you ever find yourself having to educate? Explain something. Not, not that I can think of nothing off, off the top of my head that it's a great yeah. question. But there's, I feel like there's, there's not a whole lot that I have to, you know, have to educate fair enough. on. No. no, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I, sometimes I would think that, you know, at, at some point, um, other artists who don't understand Illustrator might have an issue, but, but that's another issue altogether. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I'm pretty upfront too about uh, when I'm working with a client that it is, it's all digital and it's vector. So it, it can pretty much live at any size and, and, and scale. But, um, as far as like, like a like a conversation I keep having yeah. now, I can't I can't. That's anything. fantastic. Um, so when, so when you when you're designing these posters, one thing I noticed, and there's a video of you uh, designing a RoboCop bus. I think it was on Sci-Fi. Yeah. And um. Yeah, it's super pressure packed, by the way, because I had to do it in studio. Oh, yeah. And and I was on a laptop, my wife's laptop that I don't ever use, and it was uh. It was like not cooperating. Yeah, that was that was a that was a rough shoot. Well, I don't think it showed. I think they edited it. Really I, I was well, going to say but, you're uh, a pro because you look like it didn't even uh, make you flinch at all. So well done. But glad it comes yeah, off. it does. <laughs> and so for me, when I'm when I'm designing something, I always have this conversation in my head as to whether I should be stylizing a character or the composition or something so that it stands out and it can be recognized as my work in a sea of other artists and stuff like that. Yeah. And that to me yeah. is probably number one on my list. Something has to happen in this design so people go, that's his. And yes. um, whether that communicates or not is something that you know I'm w waiting to find out. But sometimes it's the characters. And like the Robocop right. you were designing is clearly stylized. You've done some... Uh, Evil Dead, Army of Darkness ones where you've really like changed the face and like made them look almost like a Fleischer cartoon, in my opinion. Yeah. But then yeah. sometimes it's very clear that it's not like you're not stylizing. You're doing, I mean, you're stylizing in the sense that your colors and shapes are very, uh, uh, um, you know, you, you, you're simplifying the design to big, bold colors and shapes, but it's not, it, it is an image that is immediately recognizable as a traditional version of that character. When do you decide? How do you decide that? Uh, well, a lot, I'll, I'll be honest. A lot of times when I have to do a human face, I just, I struggle mightily with, uh, just from scratch drawing a realistic human face on likeness. So I use so much reference for, for those type of jobs. I let my style carry the, carry the load on those. And then something like RoboCop, where there's really no likeness per se, um, I'll let it 
drift a little bit more towards my style. Same with the uh, like the Marvel piece we just talked about. Those are all my faces, so to speak, like the human faces. Um, but they don't have to be dead on likenesses because they're comic. Everybody does their own version. Um, so I would say there's more framework and more reference I use to build up um, when it's when it has to be a, a likeness because that that's one thing that still to this day challenges me is it just takes I can hit it it just takes me like if I know um, there's a there's a large likeness that I have to hit in a poster I know that's going to be another probably another day just to just to get that iron well out. that's my question is when when is it is it something that's worked out with the client in advance like we want an exact likeness oh. Uh, yeah, I'll usually ask. And, and, you know, a lot of times with poster work, I feel like if they have likenesses, like if likenesses are available, I feel like fans want the likeness for the most part. Um, so I just feel like at a certain point, if it's a, if it's a major star and a, and a recognizable likeness, I think the poster is going to be better off if you, uh, you know, like lean into that and you and use it to your advantage it just it just takes me more more time to that's that. another awesome point because one of the things that i've experienced and i'll be super transparent with the uh you know the mondo release of all these godzilla posters is how active and serious these collectors are and so i've been shipping posters yeah. for eight years and uh and i never had an issue on my own but i shipped 150 different prints out to uh people for these godzilla posters and I had a couple of people receive some damaged tubes, and and it was like you saw the post I think on Facebook, <laughs> like it it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. blew up, and I, you know, so it, the reason I bring that up is because when you're talking about the likenesses um, and what people react to, you learn quick when you're thrust into a bigger, uh, you know, stratosphere of audience that what has to happen going forward and sometimes that affects Absolutely. you know the the presentation of product in general like in this case or sometimes it affects the design work and like i rarely take on anime jobs or anything a anime or manga related because i i don't think i've ever been able to please anybody in that <laughs> in that sphere yeah. because it's so particular but you know you it, it does have you had specific instances where you've like readjusted or pivoted after uh, experiences like that. Yeah. And again, maybe not as a result, like maybe not as a reaction to anything, but I, when I get a job, I feel like I, I have to make the call. Does this need to be, and Mon Mondo doesn't, um, at least with me, they don't usually say this needs to be 24 by 36. This needs to be 18 by 24. I kind of make the call. Like, does somebody want a, 24 by 36 of this property hanging on their wall. Uh, typically, the, my my general rule of thumb is, um, if it's a movie, if, uh, anything film based, I try to do 24 by 36, and animated or TV shows, or I, I do 18 by 24. So I feel like that's up to me because I, I at least I think I have a decent idea of what what people actually want. You kind of play to the audience with with that at least anyway. That's amazing because you, you must get sharper through that experience when you already know in advance. Yeah. Um, dude, so one of the things that I was, wanted to ask you that goes back to maybe our first question about people adopting your style and is – so you've been working as, you know, in this style for what? You said 10 years? Maybe more? Uh, gen yeah, probably I would say that the base of this style goes back to like both – Three so, maybe is when I started to do these little like pop culture yeah. little busts. Yeah, so you, that's that's genesis. How do you sustain people's interest in the style? I've been thinking about this probably in my own head a little too much about it. Like in my head, I go through this process. Wow, people! Some people bought three prints of the three that I sold uh, through Mondo. I want to make more prints in the future. I hope those people come back. Where the hell are they going to put this stuff? They can't surely have it all on their wall. You know what I'm saying? And so I. All yeah. this is going on in my head at all times, and I wonder how do you even sustain um, the interest from other people or from fans? How do you just keep relevant? How do you keep fresh, or how do you try to do that when? Uh, well, I think first of all, you're going to evolve yeah. naturally over time uh, if you care enough about the work, which you obviously do. 
Uh, don't ever underestimate a flat file because <laughs> I I always have this. I, I always one. have this like. Cons- there are no. Uh, I mean, for, for oh, collectors. Okay. I mean, like there are there are a few people who buy like just about everything, and um, like there's obviously no way they can hang it up, but they mm. rotate it. And I'm getting that way in my studio right now. We're getting ready to move, which I'm going to have a little bit bigger studio. But I am I'm getting maxed out on toys, and I realize I have to start rotating. And I think I'm I think I'm way behind the poster collectors on that curve. Um, I can't have everything out at once, but uh, I think. And I think if you do good work, you're only going to find more people right. because they're going to talk about your work. It almost – it's like a question that it's okay to worry about because I worry about stuff like that too. But it uh, it's going to take care of itself. You're just going to get – your profile is going to get – I mean I've seen your work. I've seen your work for a while, but I never connected it to you until probably, probably the Mondo show. So it's like – you're widening just by continuing to put yeah quality yeah work yeah it's been it's been really exciting because um, it's almost like the same thing it's like you, you put the work out you get a gig the gig helps you broadcast a little wider and then everything kind of flows into the point where you can get that big gig that kind of puts you over the next hump I you, I, you just never yep. get to a point I wonder if you do where I, I feel at ease I never I never do I never do no I feel very every job I, I feel so thankful for like i honestly like every job i'm so happy to have especially right now like to have a a nice um you know lineup of work but uh no i never i never i never want to take it for granted any of it um there's there's stuff that i can't like i i i I do all my fulfillment and i like this goes back to you talking about shipping those never again um, my mom was doing it for me and um um, obviously now I don't want her over here cause I don't want her to get sick. So that I've been doing all that myself. Um, it's, it, I just, I'm stretched thin and I can't, I can't respond to every email and every, I try to, but I just can't hit every, every request I get. But I can't um, imagine cause I'm not even a 10th to the level of notoriety that you're at and I can barely do it at this point after that. <laughs> and, uh, but so that just brings me to a, another quick question I wanted to ask is, well, maybe it's not quick. It's the, you talked about in an interview comfort in production, like you're comfortable when you're making, when you're producing and that's something that you're working on, which is uh, hit home with me. Cause I'm, I'm really always thinking about this is balancing your family and that hunter gather mentality, like balancing the time that you yeah. spend not making with this notion in your head that when I'm working, I'm providing. And that's yes. something that I yeah. struggle with all the time, all the time. Yeah, well, how do you struggle in the with se- it? in the how? sense that um, I I feel like I have X amount of gigs right now that are going to take me through the end of 2020 and maybe beyond. And right. and I'm in my head, it's like the sooner I can put out a great end result for all of these, the sooner I can re up for 2021 to 2022. And I and I try, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a psychosis because in my head. I'm like, the more I can rack up, the longer I can provide in this way. Because I've been doing it yes. for 13, 14, 15 years as a teacher and then doing the artwork on the side. But it's like doing it that way gave me barely any time for family and all that kind of stuff. So now that I only have to worry about this, I'm like, okay, now I can kind of like balance. Right, but you you, you want this to expand larger. Yeah. So. You, you, I, yeah. I, I get it. I, 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 my wife and I have come up with like a system where now, especially during quarantine, we, I work, I get up early, work till about two p.m., and we try to switch off. She can do her work, and I'll hang out with the kids. I have two kids, and um, once they're back in bed, I'm usually I, I. Much as there's so much TV and movies I want to watch, I, I find myself I can't just shut it down, like until I put another couple hours in at night knowing that there's, you know, maybe it's just business stuff. Maybe it's writing proposals. Maybe it's invoicing. Maybe it's fill, fulfilling orders. There's just, there's too much to do for one person. And I, but I continue to, I continue to do it. And I realize that I, I don't count on this being like this forever. It would be fantastic if it, I don't, I don't think it's going away, but I, I, I would be, super upset with myself if I 
if I took it for granted and it went that, away. So I, I try to squeeze as much as I can in in every that's day. That's it. It's like I feel like I'm in the lucky 1% of 1% that gets to make a living doing exactly what they would do if money wasn't an issue. And that's and yeah. I and I'm t- and as great as that is, it also comes with this new neurosis of like I'm terrified <laughs> that it's going to go away at any moment. At any moment. At any moment this is going to go away and I'll have to figure something out. But I, I guess because of that, it's like – and then the other thing is like this makes me feel like I'm a contributing member of my household and my family and I'm putting food on the table and I'm able to take care of – you know, adding a new roof to the house because I drew Godzilla well. That's it. You know, that's a great feeling. <laughs> no, no, it is, it is completely absurd when you boil yeah. it down like that. I feel the same way. Like, I, the fact that I can support a family on this, and and especially right now, is is not lost on me. Yeah, I almost get a sense of guilt sometimes. Like, how dare I have it so good, you know, considering. Yeah, same. Yeah. Same. Amazing. Well, okay. So, dude, thank you so much. Um, before we 100% wrap it up, I was wondering if you have uh, a moment to show off one of your favorite uh, Godzilla toys. I saw in an interview where you had them all behind you, and uh, oh, I don't man, get to yeah. nerd out about Let this me... stuff with too many people. All right. I'll be right, I'll okay. Be right okay. back. Get two if you can. All right. This stuff is oh, all new. Shit. So okay. It's, this it's, is awesome. Oh, you got the 84 Sakai? Sakai? Heck yeah. yeah. This is... Yeah. You see that? This is um, – anybody that doesn't know X oh Plus, they are like suit accurate vinyl toys from Japan. Mm. And I get, that's the fun of this too is that you, you have to like – oh, that's awesome. Is that the 74 or 73? The yeah. Um, you have to – like these are not like easy to no. obtain. I mean it's, it's – with the internet they uh, are. Full, full disclosure, down. I would love in the future for us just to have like a conversation about this and nothing else and put it oh, – you, If you think you have five viewers now, you'll get like two and a half perfect, for that show. But I, I, I would be totally okay, down perfect, with that. Yeah. These are all like Oh, recent, the deforials, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been into these because um, they're yeah, small. Yeah. They're really well – they're not shelf hogs. But this one is especially um, – uh, important or I don't know, cool because it was sitting in a uh, in an airport in um, Tokyo for Three months. I think forty yeah. some days. Yeah, because it got hung up with yeah. the COVID. Um, I guess EMS shipping comes over on commercial flights, and there's been no commercial flight, so it was sitting there. I checked the shipping like three times a day, and it was just sitting in a warehouse or in at an airport, and it was driving me crazy. And it finally shook loose last month and it was like the greatest day it's so ever. awesome you know i didn't i didn't pick that one up i i did i passed on it even though the 84 i love that suit so much oh the destroyer and deforial those are great yeah. yeah i love that yeah for people yeah. who don't know these suits these uh figures are they're like the closest thing i could say is when mcfarland first started putting out killer toys like the movie maniacs yeah. And you were blown yep. away by the detail on that, like for Godzilla stuff, which has never really had that kind of love given to it. The, I mean, they even put the zippers in the back of some of them, so you can see. Yeah, that's completely mind blowing. They are so so, so well yeah. done, and uh, I haven't bought many of the full. I only have six or seven, like of this. The thirty size. centimeter, yeah, those are the amazing. You know, it's funny. Like I yeah. bought a few at the beginning of quarantine because I had just finally got enough money to be able to afford a few. But then I started uh, trading with some friends online uh, who had extras. Like they would buy two and three of each, and then I would. Uh, and so yeah. I would do like a little tiny carving, and I would trade it. And so I got. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, which is awesome because it's a one-off carving. And but then look at this. Oh man! Oh yeah, we we totally know, have to do a full know, episode of that. that. I can't cool. wait. The, the one that I had for three months, and then I'll let you go. Is, is this was I got it on eBay at the beginning of the quarantine. It was the sixty-seven, and yeah. uh, it was sitting there. I love this suit so much because it's the it's the I, worst you suit. Know what? I, I used to hate that suit with a passion. And now it's kind of in the last, literally in the last year, it's grown on me. It's just such a dopey yeah, looking I, suit. I hate loved it forever. And then I got the figure and I'm like, oh my God, I think I actually love it. It's so bizarre. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I know. And I, I imagine people watching this are like, they're all the no, same. Yeah. And I, it, like, 
the 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 subtle difference from suit to suit is is part of the charm of that there whole you go. For series. For anybody watching, there's, look at the difference in those two faces. You're telling me that's the same. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't contain it. I just love it. I just love it so so much. Amazing. Yeah, and I got and I got the, yeah. the the gigantic Mecha Godzilla on the way. That's my last big purchase, and uh, then I'm shutting it down. Now, next couple of weeks or something. I read. I, I didn't get them, but uh, I I thought I read that they were starting. Oh, to... that's news. That's breaking news. If that's true, amazing. Uh, 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 oh. <laughs> I just read the thing that somebody's like was surmising oh, yeah. that they're starting to. Sh- I'm gonna invite yeah. you onto the Facebook group that I'm on because it's just these. Okay. Just this. That's all it is. Amazing. Okay. All, right. All right. So let me let's let's leave it there. And before we sign off, if you would tell people where they can find you online, uh, everywhere you want to be found. Okay. So uh, my portfolio site is uh, strongstuff.net. Uh, email is tom at strongstuff.net. Uh, Twitter is strongstufftom, and Instagram is strongstuff. Amazing, dude. Tom, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, it's a big honor. Love your work. And I'm really honored okay. that we could have that we were in that same uh, group of posters together. It was a big honor for me, so I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. This is a great show. I'm looking forward to watching watching this continue awesome, to grow. Brother. Thank you so much. Oh man, I really hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. He's brilliant. Um, please remember to click like and subscribe on this video and uh, share it with some of your friends. Check out some of the other videos we got here. Some crazy, awesome stuff. And head over to skybound.com slash attack Peter to subscribe to our email list where you can get updates about new print drops, uh, new live streams that are coming up, and all kinds of good stuff coming out through um, Attack Peter and Skybound. All right, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Attack.